In June this year, my wife and I were among 2,000 people who gathered in Westminster Abbey to celebrate 150 years of Britain's highest gallantry award, the Victoria Cross. The medal was first introduced by my great-great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. At that time, there were no gallantry awards available for ordinary soldiers, only for officers. The VC was to be new and different. The Queen insisted from the start that it was a democratic award, available to all regardless of status, rank or wealth. The inspiration behind the new medal was the campaign that Britain was fighting in the Crimea. It was the first war in history to be widely reported in the newspapers, and it brought the horrors of battle home to the British people. They could see that all soldiers were brave, but wanted rare acts of supreme courage to be recognized further. So, from the beginning, the VC was both exclusive, only for the very brave, and democratic, available to all. It proved popular both with soldiers themselves and with the public. And during Queen Victoria's reign, over 500 VCs were awarded. This film tells the story of the early years of the medal and charts its journey from a new and little-known award for brave British troops to becoming the most famous gallantry award in the world. Eighteenth of October, eighteen fifty four, outside Sebastopol, Russia. Daniel! Two young midshipmen, Edward St. John Daniel, seventeen, and Henry Evelyn Wood, sixteen, see their first action of the Crimean War, bringing in lost ammunition to their gun battery. Both will win the Victoria Cross, though not today. One will reach the British Army's highest rank, whilst the other will be disgraced and become the first man to have his Victoria Cross taken away. We did it, boy. In 1854, the Victoria Cross did not yet exist, but times were changing. The British Empire was expanding rapidly, and her military men were never at rest. They would fight in more wars over the next 50 years than in the previous 200. There will be battles on the plains of Africa, skirmishes in the jungles of India, and expeditions to all corners of the globe. The great bravery of these fighting men would require special recognition. The Victorian adventure of empire and the story of the Victoria Cross went hand in hand, and they both started in earnest on a small peninsula in the south of Russia called the Crimea. In an attempt to prevent the new Russian empire increasing its influence in the Mediterranean, the British sent an armada to the Black Sea and landed on the Crimean Peninsula. After several bloody but inconclusive battles, they besieged the port of Sebastopol, the navy bringing ashore its heavy guns to bombard the city on a daily basis. Edward Daniel and Henry Evelyn Wood were stationed at the Diamond Gun Battery under Captain William Peel. Peel, the son of former Prime Minister Robert Peel, was the epitome of the heroic aristocratic officer. On one day at the Battle of Inkerman, he and Daniel led seven separate charges, that saved the regimental colors and faced down a whole troop of Russian soldiers. Captain Peel, with his aide de camp, was in the thick of the fire, and at one point they were completely surrounded by the enemy. The heroic duo were the perfect poster boys for a growing campaign calling for a new medal for acts of bravery. Both escaped, as I trust they may throughout the campaign, for they are both made of the right stuff. Henry Evelyn Wood, it seemed, was not. 
He succumbed to the cold and disease that ravaged many men as war dragged on into winter. Bitterly disappointed to be out of the action, he feared his chance of glory was slipping away. When he learned of plans for a massive assault on Sebastopol, he dragged himself from his sickbed and volunteered for action. Wood. Not well today. Not well, sir, but, but not very ill. Captain Peel had not planned on taking the invalid into battle, but Daniel intervened on his friend's behalf. Sir, we are indeed stronger with Wood at our side. Well, get some rest, both of you. In preparation for battle, Daniel and Wood made a solemn pact. That evening, Daniel and I agreed that if, as was probable, our chief was killed in the assault, one of us should stand by him or bring in his body. Both would distinguish themselves in the next day's attack. Heroic action that would lead to the creation of the Victoria Cross. You will disregard enemy fire. Advance at easy pace with your head up and your shoulders back. You will display neither fear nor undue haste. Naval Brigade, is this understood? Aye, Aye sir. Naval Brigade, advance! On the morning of the 18th of June, 1855, British forces launched a massive assault on the Russian port of Sebastopol. Captain William Peel and his men of the Naval Brigade were first to attack one of the city's vital fortified positions. For many, it was the first time in battle. But they advanced with iron discipline into a hail of Russian fire. Cannon shells, grenades and musket fire rained down on the sailors, but still they pushed on. The open ground provided no cover, and many men were hit before they could reach the objective. Henry Evelyn Wood was struck by a bullet that ricocheted off his sword. Wounded and his weapon now useless, he carried on regardless. Captain Peel was also wounded, but could not continue. He was rescued by young Edward Daniel. The day's attack was not successful, and the British forces sustained high casualties. What does I hear about the Holster? But the Naval Brigade had acquitted itself well, and Daniel was hero of the day. It comes through the battle unscathed, surviving several near misses. Shot through in three places, sir. Good God. Well, Daniel, join the club. You're lucky. Despite his injury, Henry Evelyn Wood had been the only officer to fight his way to the Russian lines. His bravery was noted by a senior commander who sent a carriage to bring the young officer back to camp. It was suggested to Queen Victoria by her Secretary of State for War that the heroism seen at Sebastopol could not be ignored and that a gallantry medal for all ranks should be considered. When this idea was put to Queen Victoria, she embraced it very enthusiastically and took uh, a very close interest in everything regarding the Victoria Cross. The design of it, what it was to be made from, and even what wording was to be placed on the front of it. The original suggestion was for bravery, but the Queen took the view that that rather implied that those soldiers who didn't receive it weren't brave. 
The Queen insisted that the wording should read for valour, and on the 29th of January 1856, she signed the Royal Warrant bringing the Victoria Cross into existence. Captain William Peel was awarded the new medal for leading attacks at Inkerman and Sebastopol. Edward Daniel was awarded his VC for bringing in ammunition to the Diamond Gun Battery and for his persistent loyalty to his commanding officer under fire. Wherever Peel went on the battlefield, Daniel was at his elbow, wouldn't leave him. There's no doubt that on that occasion, Daniel saved Peel's life. Daniel's VC resides in the Ashcroft Collection, the world's largest collection of Victoria Crosses. A special medal when awarded due to Daniel's age, he was just 17, it would become increasingly significant in the light of later events. Daniel was the youngest VC recipient in the Crimea. His 16-year-old friend, Henry Evelyn Wood, was also nominated, but to Wood's bitter disappointment, his award was turned down. A year after the Crimean War ended, the Queen presided over the first investiture of the Victoria Cross. On the 26th of June, 1857, in front of a massive crowd in London's Hyde Park, she personally decorated 62 of the 111 men who had so far earned the medal. The remaining recipients could not return to England to accept their medals. They'd been sent yet further from home on more urgent business. The very future of the empire was in question, for the threat concerned the jewel in the imperial crown, India. Delhi, 1857. For years, local opposition to British rule in India has been mounting. On Sunday the 10th of May, bloody mutiny breaks out and thousands of insurgents surround the Red Fort in Delhi, seat of British imperial power. Inside, a handful of men have stayed behind to prevent the fort's enormous arsenal of gunpowder falling into enemy hands. Against massive odds, they've held out for nearly six hours. William Rayner of the Bengal Veteran Establishment. He is 61 years old and approaching retirement. No previous combat experience. Yes, Assistant Commissary of Ordnance, John Buckley, devoted father of a young family. No previous combat experience. Well aware that the gunpowder in the fort could determine the outcome of the mutiny, the men have made a group decision to blow up the arsenal and with it, themselves. John Scully, a former labourer from Ireland, has volunteered to light the train that will blow up the entire arsenal. The explosion was heard over 40 miles away, and the castle walls reduced to rubble, killing hundreds of mutineers outside. I think this is the classic Victorian bravery, the sort of bravery that Victorian Britain expected of people who stood to their post to the last, and when, when it couldn't be defended, blew it up. I admire particularly bravery stretched over some time. 
to recognize that you will first of all put up as good a defense as you can and then eventually blow yourself up. That, that's, a, that's a long death sentence, is it not? But miraculously, not all of the British defenders were dead. Four had survived the enormous blast and were able to escape. John Buckley and William Rayner were awarded the first Victoria Crosses of the Indian Mutiny. At 61, Rayner remains the oldest recipient of the VC. John Scully was killed outright in the explosion. Under the original rules of the Victoria Cross, a fighting man had to survive his act of gallantry. As a result, Scully's bravery went unrewarded. John Buckley was later captured by mutineers. They informed him that they'd murdered his wife and children. Devastated, Buckley begged for death, but his captors refused on account of his bravery. Buckley later escaped by swimming the river Ganges and rejoined the army, where his death wish turned into a thirst for revenge. He later oversaw the execution of 150 rebels who were strapped to cannons and blown apart. Prepare to fire! Fire! He then returned to England, where the Queen awarded him his Victoria Cross. Delhi had now fallen to the insurgents, and the mutiny spread quickly through the north of India. Several other cities were besieged, and there were genuine fears that India might fall to the rebels, with dire consequences for the empire. Fighting men were called in from far and wide. Captain William Peel and Edward Daniel, fresh from action in the Crimea, landed with the naval brigade at Calcutta and travelled a thousand miles to bring vital guns to break the siege at Lucknow. On the 16th of November, 1857, Peel's force attempted to break into the city, but cannons failed to penetrate its mighty walls, and their crews were decimated by sniper fire. The attack stalled. Peel was approached by able seaman William Hall. Hall, the son of escaped slaves, and one of the few black men in the Navy, had already served the captain with distinction in the Crimea. Now he volunteered to take over the cannon closest to the town walls and operate it on his own. Firing a muzzle loading cannon was a complicated business under normal circumstances. In an ideal world, this is a carefully choreographed task carried out by half a dozen men who work together and who've done it before. To do it on your own is a remarkable feat. At the mercy of sniper fire and ricocheting debris, Paul worked the cannon single-handedly until the wall was breached and the town could be taken. His commander described this as an action almost unexampled in war and recommended him for the Victoria Cross. Hall was the first black recipient of the VC. During the Indian Mutiny, changes to the rules governing the Victoria Cross made the medal more accessible, and as many VCs were awarded as were given out in the whole of the Second World War. In all, 182 Victoria Crosses were awarded for the Indian Mutiny. Now, if you look at the numbers that were given in later wars, uh, it seems to many observers that 182 for the Indian Mutiny was a very, very high number. But in 1857, there was only the VC available to them, and therefore, relatively speaking, quite a high number were bestowed. Some men still hadn't received their medals for action in the Crimea. Captain William Peel was wounded at Lucknow and evacuated. Offered a carriage, he chose to ride in a wagon like his men. 
but the cart had been used to carry smallpox victims, and Peel contracted the disease and died soon after. He had not lived to be presented with his Victoria Cross. His death had a devastating impact on his men, especially his young favorite, Edward Daniel. Peel's other protege, Henry Evelyn Wood, who had missed out on his VC in the Crimea, arrived late in India, worried that he'd missed a chance of glory. He'd left the Navy to try his luck in the cavalry, but his first months on the subcontinent were spent suffering from sunstroke, fever, and injuries sustained falling from a giraffe. Time, he feared, was running out. Wood later saw plenty of action in the clean-up operations that defined the final 18 months of the rebellion, but a chance to shine had eluded him. When in the last days of the conflict, Wood came across a band of rebels who had captured a British informer, he grabbed his opportunity. routed the rebels, leaving several dead and allowing the informer to escape. He later insisted he'd won his Victoria Cross for one of his lesser acts of bravery, but the medal was finally his. Wood had joined the unique band of brothers that already included his friend Edward Daniel. The two were rising young stars of the empire with the world at their feet. One would deliver on his promise whilst the other would be the cause of the greatest scandal in the history of the Victoria Cross. May on CI. April Fool's Day, 1864. Six years after winning a VC in the Indian Mutiny, Valentine Bambrick is found dead in a cell at Pentonville Prison, London. Bambrick had been falsely accused and then convicted of stealing the medals of a jealous rival. Under the rules of the Victoria Cross, anyone found guilty of stealing another man's medals would forfeit his own. Bambrick's despair at having to hand back his Victoria Cross was expressed in a note found by his body. Bambrick was not the first man to forfeit his Victoria Cross, this dubious honor went to an exceptional young officer, Edward St. John Daniel. If any person on whom such distinction shall be conferred be convicted of treason, cowardice, felony, or of any infamous crime, his name shall forthwith be erased from the register. After the death of Captain Peel, Daniel's life and career had fallen apart. Twice cautioned for being drunk and missing from his post, he was under guard awaiting court-martial for a much more serious crime when he disappeared without trace. Rumors of Daniel's offense varied from sodomy with junior officers to attempted murder, but its true nature was never disclosed. It hath been reported unto us that Edward St. John Daniel, upon whom we have conferred the decoration of the Victoria Cross, has been accused of a disgraceful offence, and having evaded inquiry by desertion from our service, his name has been removed from the list of officers of our Navy. Edward Daniel became the first man and only officer ever to forfeit his Victoria Cross. He was never found, but seven years later, a man of the same name was buried in the South Island gold fields of New Zealand. In the year of Daniel's downfall, Henry Evelyn Wood VC began a rapid rise through the ranks. At the age of 24, he was promoted to captain in the jungles of central India. Age 33, he was promoted to major and fought cannibals in a shanty. 
At 41, Lieutenant Colonel Wood was sent to South Africa to put down Bush rebellions. And 1879 found him in Zululand, third in command of an army that had just suffered one of the worst defeats in the history of the empire. 22nd of January, 1879, a British invasion army has just been routed by Zulu at the Battle of Isand Luana, leaving 1,500 Imperial soldiers dead. Pursued by the enemy, two lieutenants make an heroic attempt to save the regimental colors by getting the flag back to British-held Natal on the far side of the Buffalo River. The two officers Tinmouth Melville and Neville Coggill made it to the river and managed to get across, but here, wounded and exhausted, they were cornered and killed. It would be 28 years before either man would be awarded his Victoria Cross. Two miles downriver, was Lieutenant John Chard. Chard, considered a less than average officer by his superiors, had been left to oversee a supply station and field hospital at Rourke's Drift. I went down to my tent by the river, had some lunch comfortably, when my attention was called by the horsemen galloping towards me from the direction of Isandwana. By the gesticulation and shouts, I saw that something was the matter. Back at Rourke's Drift, all was quiet. B Company of the 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment, was not expecting any trouble. After all, this tiny garrison was not exactly in the front line. Said your legs getting better? In the field hospital was Private Harry Hook. Doctor says you'll be ready in a couple of days to go back. Hook had left a young wife at home in Gloucestershire when he joined the army two years before. He was now a regimental cook. Lots of blanco, lots of boot polishing and polish. We were all knocking about, and I was making tea for the sick. Look, look, where are you? Suddenly there was a commotion in the camp, and then we knew what had happened to our comrades. Zulus! They've killed everyone, they're nearly by the river! They had been butchered to a man. That was awful enough, but worse was to follow, for we were told that the Zulus were coming straight on for Miss Andwana to attack us. Just over 100 men were fit to fight, and they had less than an hour to prepare for the arrival of the Zulu army. Hold your position. Lieutenant Chard, a royal engineer, brought practical know-how to the construction of the defences, but he had virtually no combat experience. The real problem facing Zulus, if you were armed with a single-shot rifle, was that they would simply overwhelm you before you had time to reload. You simply couldn't kill enough with the process of reloading and firing. And it was also quite clear to everybody that this wasn't an enemy you could surrender to, um, that you were either going to win or die, and die pretty unpleasantly. So I, th I think that set steel into men's souls. Private Fred Hitch was sent to the hospital roof to watch for the arrival of the enemy. Hitch, a petty criminal, had been given the option by a judge of military service or prison. He had chosen the army, a decision he may now have been regretting. Having got to the top of the building, I could plainly see the Zulus forming up just over the brow of a hill. They're ready to attack, sir, I called out, and I think there are about 4,000 of them. A little fella remarked, Oh, if that's all there are, we can manage that lot all right. Number one section, ready? Two rounds independent, 
Fire at will! We opened fire on them between five and six hundred yards, and the Zulus began to fall very thick. However, it did not seem to stop them at all, and they rushed on, in spite of their heavy loss, to within 50 yards of the wall. The Zulus came on at a wild rush, and although many of them were shot down, they got to within about 50 yards of our wall of mealy bags and biscuit boxes. They were caught between two fires, that from the hospital and that from the storehouse, and were checked. The first attack was driven back, but the defenders were under no illusions. There would be many more. Fire! A rapid rattle of fire from our rifles, and in a few moments the Zulus were driven back, disappearing in the bush as before. A brief interval and the attack would be made again and repulsed in the same manner. Over and over again this happened, our men behaving with the greatest coolness and gallantry. A section of Zulus concentrated their attack on the hospital. Come on, boys. Got plenty for you. The Zulus were swarming around us, and there was an extraordinary rattle as the bullets struck the biscuit boxes and queer thuds as they plumped into the bags of mealies. Then there were the whiz and rip of the assegais. The attackers got closer, and a desperate hand-to-hand -hand struggle ensued. A big Zulu sprang forward and seized my rifle, but I held on for all I could and, slipping a cartridge in, I shot him point-blank. Time after time, the Zulus gripped the muzzle and tried to tear the rifle from my grasp. And time after time, I wrenched it back and fired. Thwarted in their initial attempt to take the hospital, the Zulus set fire to the building's straw roof, and the fire quickly spread. What were we to do? We were pinned like rats in a hole. Already the Zulus were fiercely trying to burst in through the doorway. The only way of escape was the wall itself, by making a hole big enough for a man to crawl through into the adjoining room. Hook and the patients made it out of the hospital just before the burning roof collapsed. Go! Go! The defenders held out until dark, but the night made their situation even more desperate. As darkness came on, we were completely surrounded, and every now and then a confused shout of Usutu from many voices seemed to show that they were going to attack from one side and immediately the same thing would happen on the other, leaving us in doubt as to where they meant to attack. But by setting fire to the hospital, the Zulus had inadvertently aided the defenders' cause. The hospital fire became more fierce. This fire turned out to be our salvation, for as darkness came on, it lit up the ground on all sides of the lager and enabled us to see the Zulus whenever they approached the barricades. As night wore on, the men of the 24th were forced into a desperate last-ditch defence. They still came on right up to the barricades and were only turned by the good, cold steel of our bayonets, for which they had far more respect than for bullets. Then it was load and fire and bayonet just as fast as we could. As fast as the defenders were, it seemed only a matter of time before they would be overrun. A Zulu bullet ripped through Private Hitch's shoulder, incapacitating him. He would play no further part in the battle that some of his mates now feared was lost. Seeing how badly wounded I was, one of my comrades asked me whether he should put me out when it came to the finish. He could see that my strength was fast failing, and that if the devils got through, I would be quite unable to strike a blow for myself. Nah, I don't think I want any, I said. But 
around 4 a.m., the Zulu attacks inexplicably ceased. There followed an anxious wait for dawn. But at first light, it became clear that the Zulus had withdrawn, leaving 400 of their men dead. 15 British soldiers had been killed, and another two would die of their wounds. Of the 20,000 rounds of ammunition stored at Rourke's Drift, only a few hundred remained. It had been a close-run thing, but a small force, under inexperienced leadership, had held out against overwhelming odds. Later that morning, relief arrived under Lieutenant General Lord Chelmsford, who asked to hear first-hand accounts of the night's heroism. When the Commander-in-Chief arrived, I was in my shirt sleeves. A sergeant ran up and said, Come as you are, straight away. Lord Chelmsford asked me all about the defence of the hospital. An officer took our names and wrote down what we had done. These first accounts would form the basis of the recommendations for awards that would follow. It was not till the next morning that I came to. Later on in the day, Lord Chelmsford himself came to me and, bending down beside me, said, I will recommend you for the VC. I think we did well. Private Hitch would not be the only one to be honoured. Eleven VCs were presented for the defence of Rourke's Drift, uh, which given the number of men involved in total um, and the fact that the whole thing was over in a night and a day, was an extraordinarily high number. No similar number has ever been given for a single action. So it's, it's a quite unique event in the wider history of the VC. Fred Hitch, the former criminal, was one of the 11 awarded the Victoria Cross. 20 years later, his medal went missing. Hitch claimed it had been stolen, whilst others suspected him of faking the theft and selling his VC for personal gain. Harry Hook was awarded his VC for defending and evacuating the hospital. He returned home proudly with his medal to find that his wife, thinking him dead, had run off with another man. John Chard, the man many considered an inadequate officer, was awarded his VC for his exceptional leadership in what was already being described as one of the greatest defensive actions in military history. The British went on to defeat the Zulu nation, but in the process, they made themselves another enemy in South Africa that would prove a far greater threat to the empire. Fifteenth of December, 1899, Natal, South Africa. The first weeks of the Boer War, the last and largest conflict of the Victorian era. The empire is at its peak in size and influence, but its forces are being hampered by an improvised army of Boer farmers and settlers. The British have suffered two major defeats and are now encamped near Colenso, preparing to cross into Boer-held territory. The Battle of Colenso will be one of the most significant in the history of the Victoria Cross. An attempt to cross the Tugela River that morning stalled when gun crews, brought too close to the Boer lines, were mown down by rifle fire. Ten vital guns were now unmanned and in danger of falling into enemy hands. Leaving these guns silent in the veldt, where they would be taken when the battle was over by the Boers would have been hugely humiliating. And so when, when the word went up for volunteers to save the guns, anybody who was anybody, the hairs on the back of their neck would have stood up and they'd have been up for it. A group of officers and men assembled to retrieve the first of the precious guns. At the head, Captain Harry Schofield, well known as a fine polo player, with an impressive string of ponies. Freddie Roberts, whose father won a VC in the Indian Mutiny and was now one of the most senior commanders in the military. 
Believing that the enemy had pulled back, the group headed in. But the Boer sharpshooters were lying in wait, and as soon as the riders came within range, open fire. Captain Walter Congreve was the first man to be hit, a bullet going through his calf and into his horse which threw him. The other riders continued on at speed to the abandoned guns, knowing that as soon as they hit the ground, they would become easy targets. Back down the trail, Congreve found cover. He spotted Freddie Roberts, who had also been hit and fallen. Wounded in the stomach and unable to move, he was a sitting duck. In a hail of gunfire, the men set about hooking up the stranded gun. Any mistakes now would mean certain death. Despite his desperate position, Roberts urged Congreve not to come to his aid. He was afraid the enemy was using him as bait to attract others into their sights. With the seconds ticking by and the Boer bullets getting closer with every shot, the gun was finally hitched up and raced back to British lines. Congreve broke cover and braving enemy fire from all sides, reached Roberts and helped him back towards safety. For this, he would be awarded the Victoria Cross. Despite these heroics, only one other gun was retrieved, and the day's battle ended in defeat. And there was further bad news. Freddie Roberts was hit again and later died of his wounds. It was a dark moment in what would be known as Black Week, the British military's most disastrous few days in a century. When Queen Victoria died two years later, her death marked a turning point for the medal that bore her name. In 45 years, the rules under which the VC was awarded had changed little. Now things would change rapidly, and the action at Colenso would prove the catalyst. First was the case of Freddie Roberts. Up until that time, no VCs had been awarded posthumously. But young Roberts happened to be the son of Field Marshal Lord Roberts, uh, one of the army's most senior commanders. Uh, and sufficient to say, Roberts was recommended for the Victoria Cross and did receive it. Roberts VC led to rewards to six other men who had died in the Boer War and to a further six who had died in previous actions dating back to Rourke's Drift nearly 30 years before. But no rewards were made for actions before the Zulu War, leaving many heroic acts unrecognised. The impact of Colenso went further when Harry Schofield was not awarded the VC for his role in saving the guns. Now, when the news got back to England that Schofield had been passed over, um, a public campaign was mounted to get him the proper recognition that he deserved. And it was really the first properly orchestrated campaign that had any bearing on the Victoria Cross or the manner in which it was awarded. And a year after the event, Schofield had his Victoria Cross. The legacy of Colenso did not end there. George Ravenhill, awarded the VC for his part in saving the guns, was later convicted of stealing six shillings worth of iron and had his medal taken away but he would be the last man to forfeit his Victoria Cross. The King later declaring that no man should ever forfeit his VC, even if sent to the scaffold for murder. It was now almost half a century 
since the inauguration of the Victoria Cross. It had been a long and eventful road, but some had survived the journey. In 1903, Henry Evelyn Wood was promoted to Field Marshal, the Army's highest rank. In the same year, a journalist described a meeting with a London tramp whose life story bore an uncanny resemblance to that of Edward St. John Daniel, believed dead 40 years before. The man claimed to have joined the Navy as a boy, served in the Crimea and India, won the Victoria Cross, and for unspecified crimes, had his precious medal taken away. The man did not give his name, and his identity has never been established. <laughs>